Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. As 2018 winds to a close and we look ahead to a new year, we wonder what's in store for 2019 in cybersecurity. Today we've got five F-Secure experts here to make their predictions about exactly that and to talk about some of the notable trends in 2018 as well. Let's drop right into the conversation. We recorded this episode with Adam and Tom connecting remotely and Laura, Arturi and Andy in the room with me. So Adam, looking at 2018, what was noteworthy to you? Um, so I think the most noteworthy trend um, that we observed in 2018 uh, was probably the rise in, in mobile phishing as a threat to employees. Um, that's both SMS phishing and sort of general phishing um, being sent to mobile devices. This is not only in terms of frequency, but also in terms of effectiveness. So we've seen a dramatic increase in actually the amount um, of phishing that's going through mobile devices. And also our own internal data shows a slight increase in how vulnerable people are to this. Okay. You know, the, the, the reasons for this, I, I think, are quite interesting. I mean, obviously, there's sort of a huge increase in the use of mobile systems that they're becoming almost functionally similar to desktops and laptops. And I think also there's a, a, an important and kind of subtle behavioral point here. You know, we have naturally different patterns of behavior when we're feeling relaxed or at ease. Um, and of course, you know, we tend to use our desktops, our laptops in a work context, in the office, for example. Um, whereas mobile phishing catches us in, in weaker moments, I think, maybe when we're on the tube or or even on a Friday night having drinks. So the behavioral science term for this is cognitive ease. And when we're in a state of cognitive ease, we actually, we tend to feel more trusting, we feel warmer. And so we're seeing uh, the fact that, you know, mobile phishing is actually a more powerful attack vector uh, than email phishing. Because we're more comfortable with the with the device in our hands. We're less likely to be suspicious. Yeah, so, so that's a large part of this. I also think the, you know, how do we typically overcome phishing in general? Uh, we have security awareness training. And actually, that security awareness training is very often done in the office, done at work. It sort of reinforces this kind of implicit point that actually security is something which happens at work. And when people, you know, don't necessarily take it home with them to use, you know, on their mobile devices when they're at home, you know, the, the awareness training is kind of training people for one particular context and maybe not one that's even more impactful. There's an interesting behavioral science study uh, people who study for exams in, in a similar setting to where the exam eventually takes place actually outperform those who study for exams in, you know, kind of at home or in, in any given random context. Um, and I think the similar thing is true for security awareness. So actually, if we kind of move the way we do security awareness mm-hmm. training from being very office centric, very at work centric, and actually towards sort of point in time training on on mobile devices, there's probably an angle there in terms of how we can head off this trend. You know, the more on the the technical side, you know, obviously a lot of devices are unmanaged. We can move towards using managed devices, uh, using mobile endpoint protection, um, and just generally tightening up technical controls on mobiles. Passwords as well, right? People tend to think, well, you know, I don't necessarily need to protect it to quite the same way. Stuff on a mobile is less impactful. Um, And that's increasingly untrue, I think. I never thought about the idea of, of how the environment of the training affects your behavior. That's, that's interesting. Do you think it's as easy for us to behave uh, in a good way on a mobile device? I mean, you can't hover over links to see where they actually point and so forth. Well, absolutely. Um, yeah, in terms of our raw capability, um, before we even get to sort of human psychology of the use of the devices, um, absolutely, I think there's, there are a lot of inbuilt challenges there. Um, you can't hover over links so easily and and kind of scan these things. Very often it's harder to test the URL, test the domain. Uh, you know, there are challenges there before we even get to actually the differences in terms of how people use these devices and the fact that we're naturally more trusting of them. Are you seeing this primarily for regular phishing or have you seen any examples of spear phishing done in this way? So I think the difference between... Uh, spear phishing and regular phishing in terms of frequency, you know, how much is in each of these is probably roughly similar to to what you get through email, through a, a laptop. Uh, you know, I don't think there's necessarily more or less. The nature of what we would classify as spear phishing when it comes to mobile devices 
is kind of is interesting, right? You know, for example, you can you know we, we get attacks where quite literally it, it comes from the same thread um, as your bank, for example. In that sense, the kind of the bank is compromised. You know, that has the effectiveness. Uh, believability, trustworthiness of spear phishing, although maybe can be done en masse. And, and so for that reason, it's actually you know particularly important that people understand how uh, how this can happen, how you know they're actually vulnerable on on mobile as well. Now in in espionage cases, for instance, you don't necessarily need to compromise anything other than the person's mobile device, and you already get a view into a large part of their life. And, and there have been cases where suspected state-sponsored actors target purely the mobile devices of their targets uh, via, uh, for instance, SMS phishing and try to get malware on those mobile devices because most people have email on their phones already and they do lots of phone calls and text messaging and so forth. So that, that's already very valuable from an intelligence perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. What are your predictions for uh, 2019, Adam? What are we going to see more in, in the next year? Something I've seen beginning this year, I think is really going to take off next year, it is a trend of organizations being interested not only in what their employees are doing in terms of click rate, download rate, responding to voice phishing, that sort of thing, but also why they are doing these things. Uh, I, I think for too long, there's been an assumption that, you know, if organization A has a high click rate, um, let's say on email phishing, and organization B has the same observable high click rate on email phishing, that they should be offered more or less the same solution. And in fact, that's like you know going to the doctor with a headache, a strong headache, and the doctor saying, yes, we have a, a pill that deals with headaches. You know, actually in one case, the underlying kind of problem could be uh, one, one disease, one vulnerability, one issue. And in another case, the underlying issue could be quite different. And so I think delving into the root cause analysis here uh, allows us to actually look into getting fundamental different solutions, which are quite bespoke. Um, and I think that's probably really going to take off in, in 2019. It's kind of that next level analysis of what's really going on. For companies, it's very important in the future to actually invest in the training and actually the awareness part of the security, because most of the time for the attacker, the path of least resistance is actually through the employers, through phishing and through these kinds of attacks. So I think this is going to be ever more relevant in the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, what was noteworthy in 2018 for you? Um, as far as trends in 2018, I think we've kind of hit peak ransomware, at least when it comes to the awareness part. Companies are aware that they can get hit by very opportunistic attackers that try to wedge themselves into their organization, either by internet exposed assets or through phishing campaigns. We've seen lots of big companies getting hit and that kind of uh, has spurred other uh, companies into uh, actually focusing on this to see how they can be impacted um, and how they might be a victim of this. So that's certainly a, a, a good thing, a positive thing uh, when looking at the uh, information security market. I think related to ransomware, I, I fully agree that it feels to me like the easy money or the low-hanging fruit has been collected already and attackers are trying to figure out new ways of making money because it's just it just isn't as easy anymore. I think we've seen it on the consumer side for a few years already uh, that that ransomware isn't doesn't seem to be as profitable anymore. And th I think that's in big part why attackers start shifting to extorting companies. But now companies are are also finally waking up to this, and and I I think. As it gets harder to make money via extortion and ransomware, attackers will try and find the next easy money. So it's going to be crypto miners from here on out? I think crypto miners is is probably one of the areas where attackers have been shifting to again because, you know, cryptocurrencies came fami became familiar to them, if not before, then finally with the ransomware. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that's something they know, they know how to turn cryptocurrencies into real world cash so that they can actually go and buy their BMWs then, you know, crypto mining is kind of an easier jump. Absolutely. And we're going to see ransomware pop up, you know, wherever it can on a more opportunistic basis. But as you already mentioned, I think as an industry, we've been, I think, successful through, you know, different methods on raising the cost of attack. And that's ultimately what you want as an industry. I wanted to ask um, crypto miners, like, do we know how much money they're actually making? Because obviously ransomware is it's a service. It, you need a whole infrastructure around it. You need people 
support people, right, who can help you get your Bitcoin and pay it. And you need um, infrastructure in order to be able to pay or, or be able to give the uh, the key when someone pays and all that. So, I mean, whereas crypto, crypto miners are free and they're non-intrusive. If someone has a crypto miner, they probably don't even know and, and they won't do anything about it anyway. But like, my question is like, okay, there is an overhead to ransomware and all that, but like, is, is uh, this crypto miner stuff making like a net profit as much as they were with ransomware? I have no idea how high you can go with crypto mining, but one example that I recently ran into was a case from earlier this summer where a researcher had found multiple infected Docker containers on Docker Hub, uh, an open repository for Docker images. And those Docker malicious Docker images, they included crypto miners on them. So that whenever someone used one of those images as the base for their own work, they were unknown to them actually mining uh, cryptocurrencies as well. And in that case, the researchers estimated that the attackers had made about $90,000 just on that single case in the Monero cryptocurrency. As a second trend, I would say that we are seeing more companies with questions aimed towards us and other security companies with regards to designing systems and solutions with privacy built in, uh, not only because of GDPR, but GDPR is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to that. A lot of companies have kind of gone through the GDPR meat grinder, and it's not exactly a experience they want to repeat. So. Um, while trying to get away from the more reactive way of looking at things, uh, companies are now, you know, not all of them, obviously, but the, the larger companies, uh, we see them looking at design specs and more requirements when it comes to trying to prevent these situations from happening and trying to come up with a design where privacy can be at least controlled. That's a very encouraging thought. I think as an industry, we've for a long time, we've been sort of stuck in the same trenches, figuring that nothing ever changes, people's, people still falling for the same fish as they were five years ago and so forth. But, but you're actually seeing that things are improving. Well, we see a slight improvement. Um, and, and if something is to be learned is that, you know, human beings will never learn. So I'm a big uh, proponent of the, uh, the prevent principle. Uh, and then kind of more the reactive, uh, the reactive parts of the security awareness and, and other themes. So I sincerely hope for 2019 that companies and organizations alike put more money in the, the preventative side and then the security awareness. I mean, you need both, but there's a certain order to do them in. Are you talking about awareness training as in classroom training or everything related to that space like phishing I, I mean, campaigns? Well, phishing, I mean, doing lots of red teaming we usually get in by sending emails. Now, I ask you and the listeners, who is sending you all these office documents from the internet? We have on-premise SharePoint and file sharing services. If you really need to get office documents from people that are not linked to your company, but then set, set up a, a share drive or find some other way to interact with that person, but the fact that everyone is just given this, this right and privilege to receive documents which might contain malicious code for people who almost never have to receive office documents from outside the company, I'm a very big believer in the preventative side and just replacing those methods with very specific file sharing services and having rules and policies about that than to just allow a blanket privilege of allowing everyone to receive potentially malicious code and trying to stack security defenses onto each other and then trying to provide security awareness training on top of that saying, I know the functionality is there. I know you don't really need it, but please try not to click on anything. And I think that's a little bit backwards. I don't know, Tom, I think you're going to be super unpopular when you enforce rules in companies where people can't receive uh, Word documents as email attachments anymore. Oh, they can. They can. But you have to make it easier. You have to replace it with something else. If it means that I can, I can easily, just like I would invite someone to a Skype call uh, in Outlook in two seconds, I should be able to set up a, share, a file sharing link to someone that then that person can use to actually get the files to me. Oh, I gotcha. It requires a different way of thinking. It might not be popular. Um, but it certainly helps by trying to split up these domains. And in the same discussion, we ask companies, show us the computers that you're using that can access your payroll, that can access your most critical systems. 
and the person in question points at their computer. And then we ask them, where, from where do you receive emails from the internet, Facebook, YouTube, and they look very confused at you and they point to the same computer. Now, instant response services, either internally and certainly externally, are not cheap to say the least. So the cost of just finding out if something is an incident already outweighs the price of an extra computer or process that would split those domains and thus kind of reinforce that, that preventative uh, recommendation. In general, I strongly agree and I'm a big believer that we put too much blame on the humans or, or the human aspect of this and we have a long ways to go in the cybersecurity industry towards uh, helping people n do more right or not make mistakes as often. I don't think we can just blame people. But when it comes to file sharing, for instance, I've struggled a lot with trying to figure out what would be a good solution is, uh, on the one hand, it's obvious that if we could reduce the amount of, or the usage of email attachments and just sharing office documents, for instance, as email attachments, then, you know, when a bad guy sends you a Word document and wants you to click on it, it would be much more suspicious because that doesn't happen usually. But then if the alternative is to start using file sharing services for that, then the other popular method uh, for bad guys to get you to execute their office document is to send you a link saying, please go to this thing to download this e-fax or this invoice or whatever. So do we then risk that we actually, that we either train the humans to click on links in emails to file sharing sites and just open up whatever they download from the internet, or we risk teaching them to just open up whatever email attachment they open. So is there some kind of balance or is there some third way that we could actually do it where we wouldn't have to reinforce one or the other dangerous behavior. Yeah, I mean, when I'm looking at a, a file share thing, I don't find it suspicious if it asks, asks for my credentials, whereas when I open a Word document, it is more suspicious. Well, not to mention that our in-house uh, security training, like phishing training thing, does send like Dropbox looking links to us. My, ideally, you want to come to a, a situation where that whole situation can be avoided. I would rather you know, kind of look at what kind of interactions are, are, are required for whatever part of the business and to see how that can be, uh, how, how security can be um, enforced by not having to do that, but by having certain applications in place um, where those things would just be set up, would just work. Again, in the same way that you would just generate a, uh, a Skype link or whatever it is, so that the only thing you have to do is go into the application, and if it doesn't show up there, well, then something is malfunctioning. Interesting. Maybe one uh, other prediction that I have for 2019, uh, which will continue in the future, I think, is that um, automation and detection and response capabilities at, at customers uh, are driving up the price for attackers performing targeted attacks. I mean, we perform lots of targeted attacks, uh, targeted attack simulations for customers, um, and with well, we see a different trend at customers where more and more software and services are being introduced um, because they are being hit by certain attacks or because their competitors are being hit. And that increase in automation when it comes to detection uh, is, of course, discouraging some attackers and making it more difficult for other attackers to either try and slip into companies uh, in an undetected uh, way. And I, of course, hope that that continues because we want that price of attack to, to go up. So what else caught our eye in uh, 2018, Laura? One uh, very interesting trend is the uh, how privacy was impacted both uh, positively and negatively. So we have GDPR, that's a really good initiative to actually improve privacy for end users and consumers. But at the same time, we were faced with these big uh, privacy pre breaches, such as the Facebook breach. Uh, it affected not only the users of Facebook, but also uh, the applications that are using the single sign-on feature of the Facebook application. So uh, when the attackers were able to access, uh, get the access tokens uh, of these users, they could actually log into these third-party applications. And uh, there are ways of doing this uh, single sign-on solution securely so that... Uh, 
each time you log into this third party application, you actually have to provide your Facebook credentials again. So uh, that prevents these kind of attacks. But most of the single sign up uh, sign on applications that are using uh, Facebook as an identity provider are uh, not implementing it in, in this way. So they what they're doing, they're actually sacrificing uh, security over usability, which is like a really common thing to do when you're thinking about user experience. But at the same time, when breaches like this happen, it means that somebody can get these access tokens and be able to log into your applications and let's say uh, Uber, Tinder and other applications that are using Facebook as a single sign-on identity provider. And they could potentially get into very uh, sensitive details about you, not only like who you've been talking to, but also the conversations who, uh, that you've had with other people, uh, where you've been, where, what have you bought and stuff like that. So I think people are starting to understand how much they're actually trusting with these uh, big technology companies uh, and it's just data for them and, and you're hoping that they'll take good care of it. You've uh, gone ahead now and invoked the coast of GDPR in the room, so uh, I have to ask the obvious question. Are we going to see big fines in 2019? Naturally, I hope that every everything has gone nice and solid and, and there are nothing to worry about. But I'm afraid that we will see some fines coming up. You talked about how it would be theoretically possible to mm. get into someone's Tinder Did or something like that. Did you ever see anything like that happening? No, I mean, for example, the Tinder part was uh, research done by some information sec security researchers. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name right now. It was hypothetical most of these like what were the things that you could actually do with the access credentials you could for example log in on somebody's tinder and uh, read the messages there and they would remain in unread state so the person whose account you accessed could actually not even realize that you've accessed those me messages and uh, for uber i think they were able to tip the driver with your access tokens the investigation is naturally still going on but the com companies they uh, couldn't find like uh, that anyone has had actually used this but we don't know what what's going to turn up in the future of course what about 2019 laura what's uh, what does the future have in store for us this year uh, or also in the past, we've seen IoT uh, growing like this, purely IoT devices, so uh, smart devices and enterprise smart devices, but also just internet co connected devices overall. So as we're seeing increased growth in those, I assume that we're going to see more exploitation of those devices as well. This year, we've seen devices being exploited from just poor password policies to remote code execution to DNS rebinding attacks and, and whatnot. So I think these will be very relevant also in the coming year. And what I really hope that will happen next year is that we will start to get some more uh, regulations around IoT. So there would have to be more regulations on what kind of uh, security uh, levels these devices have to fulfill before they enter the market and how does the automatic updating processes go for them and uh, just like overall information security posture for these some of these are going to end up in the consumer households for example so we need some more like concrete consumer protection there as well for the consumers and I think like GDPR wise the GDPR could be extended to actually cover the IoT devices or some other regulation could uh, come in place that would extend the GDPR to actually cover these IoT devices as well. Do you think we're going to be seeing more uh, IoT companies with bug bounty programs and would that be something you'd welcome? I would definitely welcome that. Uh, I know there are some uh, problems with the companies enrolling in these bug bounty programs for uh, IoT de devices because, for example, the update processes are, they can be pretty complicated. So it's not easy to update these IoT firmware or hardware uh, for the bugs they, they that are actually discovered. But from what I've spoken with the people who do bug bounties, they would be super interested and they are already doing this uh, to some extent, but there's no platform to actually uh, reporting these like uh, concrete platforms. So yeah, I'm, I hope that more, more companies would go for this, especially for uh, home smart devices. 
we see more and more people being introduced to hardware hacking, building IoT gadgets, finding out what the interaction models are for particular scenarios. And in the long run, that is going to help us in, in, in you know, building the competence that we need right now, which we so much lack, which is trying to find ways of building secure systems that have security by design, that have not that have generated dynamic and unique passwords when you take it out of the box that have built in software update services for infrastructure that you actually are paying for as part of the price. Um, and it's these kinds of things that will really help us 10 years from now, um, not just by the industry, but also, for example, the proliferation of, of hacker spaces, which are more focusing on building things with hardware. And I think that's a, a trend that uh, I hope will uh, come to fruition in the years to come. There is still this fetish belief that the market will figure it out and the market is not going to figure it out because neither the buyer nor the vendor are interested in security at this point. It is not a selling point. And Mikko Hupunen, you know, hammers on this time and time again, and he's right. I mean, we need to create solid incentives for security and not just, you know, the, uh, the sort of Damocles above your head because some legislation is going to come, uh, come knocking down on you. But unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, come up with a, a common set of requirements as to what we want the future to look like. Arturi, um, you want to talk about supply chains? Yeah, I I think supply chain attacks are something that has been talked about quite a lot already over the past years. It's been brewing in the background for a long time. It feels to me like it's becoming in, in, an increasingly common and big problem. I do expect it to increase in the future as well. Uh, in terms of what I mean by supply chain act attacks, the supply chain attack that people most often think to is the NotPetya case from summer of uh, 2017. The way the ma uh, ransomware initially started spreading was as a compromised update for the counting software that was most popular in Ukraine. And that's definitely one, uh, one type of supply chain attack. Another area that's been talked about quite a lot is compromising a service provider, for instance, as a way to then gain access to the customers of that service provider. I think another interesting area of supply chain attacks or that I liken to supply chain attacks is kind of breach of trust in terms of you're putting a lot of trust on the creators or the maintainers of software to continue doing what they've promised to do, continue providing the software that they say they're providing. And there's, for instance, there was an interesting case about two weeks back in Finland, where people use ad blockers often in their email uh, or in their web browsers. Uh, and then there's lists of kind of the bad URLs for ad blockers to block. And some of those are country specific. So then there's a popular list of Finnish ad networks or Finnish advertising sites maintained by a Finnish person. And then those get blocked uh, when you have that, you know, set to automatically include those URLs. Now, the maintainer of that Finnish list of ad sites decided to make a political statement uh, and actually made a change to the list, added a comment saying, you know, because of some uh, discussions between the Finnish government and trade unions about workers' rights, and uh, the person had a strong opinion on this, so they decided to also add the websites of the ma major Finnish workers' unions to the list of blocked sites, and suddenly people were unable to access the sites of workers' unions because of this political statement. And this was not kind of a malicious third party compromising a supply chain. This was just, you know, the person who'd been providing a really, really good list and keeping it up to date and so forth, suddenly doing something other than what people uh, were trusting him to do. But there's also been cases of, um, for example, somebody running like a, a browser add-on and then stopping developing it and selling it or, or the add-on getting misplaced somehow and somebody gains access to it and starts using it for other purposes. I think that's definitely another other really good example of, you know, we're putting large parts of our lives in the hands of others where we don't always realize how much we're relying on others or trusting others. And we don't really have a way of verifying that they are still worthy of that trust. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Arturi, especially when it comes to developers going to the continuous delivery and continuous integration models. They rely more heavily like than before maybe on these uh, 
for example, Docker, and you have all these JavaScript, NPM, uh, these repositories, and you are pr uh, trusting them to provide you with the same level of security that, uh, that you would uh, expect them to have. Of course, uh, companies have come up with ways to mitigating those issues as well by just like having private repositories for Docker or N NPM, the same as you would have for Lin Linux repositories, for example. And I think it's an uh, interesting trend and it, it becomes more lucrative to actually attack the source code itself than to attack any other part of the application because the frameworks themselves are becoming so advanced. They, they are not that vulnerable to like basic attacks any, any longer. And especially when you have these continuous pipelines, it's harder to get in between any other uh, part of that developmental life cycle. I agree that that's definitely another important area and I think closely related to that is again the way people are the way software is being developed these days where you know it's it's very common to take components from others and utilize those as well source code repositories have always been the target of of attackers any kind of thing on the internet software wise or service wise has been the target for opportunistic attackers um so when we say supply chain attacks, doesn't that mean basically anything that can be used by someone else on the internet? I mean, for on the on the targeted side, I mean, when we saw the uh, the compromise of RSA for the sole purpose of, of getting into Lockheed Martin in 2006, I think, I could be wrong. I mean, that was really targeted and, and that would fully put into the, uh, to the bucket of that was a targeted supply chain attack where one person or an organization saw the dependency between two things and said, okay, we can't attack this thing directly, so let's uh, let's try a different way. But as far as you know, history is concerned, I mean, we had Arc Linux being completely compromised. We have packages that are being backdoored because there are so many players um, as part of the, um, the process. So I agree with you that we're going to see uh, a lot more of this. But I think that's also kind of because of the fact that companies are using more cloud services. Most companies that we've done business for on the development side, I mean, the only infrastructure they have is the Wi-Fi router in the corner. All the rest lives at GitHub and Azure. Could we in fact define supply chain attacks even wider than that? I mean, we come across as a lot of companies who are choosing to trust this or that component or library or whatever they use because, you know, it's been used so widely and things like that. So, But these are all like upstream from the company point of view. So it's all supply chain. The, the way I'd, I'd put it, I think one of the key takeaways is the way attackers breach your organization may not be something that's directly under your control or something that you've thought of as being your responsibility. This ties into discussions like IoT as well of, you know, is an IoT device keeping it up to date? Is it the consumer's responsibility or IoT in, in corporate environments? But yeah, companies companies are, you know, they try and figure out what they're responsible for time to take care of that. But it gets much harder when there are things that may, may you know, cause risks for you that you can't actually control. Our resident AI guy, Andy, you wanted to talk about uh, machine learning, and I think you wanted to focus on reinforcement learning. What would, in layman's terms, be reinforcement learning? Like, how would you define that in a nutshell? The process of teaching an actor to interact with this environment based on receiving rewards, depending upon the actions it takes. So at the beginning, um, your reinforcement learning model, it doesn't know what to do. So it guesses things and it sees what happens. And eventually it figures out that like this thing is better. So then it goes over to, to predicting to do these things and then it ends up behaving in some way that you want it to. So when I have my reinforcement learning algorithm learning to play a racing game, the first thing it tries is driving straight into a wall. And when that doesn't work, it tries something else the next time and eventually figures yeah. to stay on the road. Actually, what would happen is it would, it would press the gas, it would press the brake, it would turn, it would turn, it would press the gas. It would, do, it would spaz around for a very long time until it like, starts to figure out what, 
what is good, and then it starts learning that, oh, press the gas a lot, oh, then it hits a wall, and then it's like, okay, press the gas and turn, and then it skids out of control, and then it's like, okay, we'll press the gas, now hit the brakes really hard, and then it sort of stops, and then it might end up turning around and going the wrong way, or, you know, but like, it'll, it'll try lots of things until it figures out what's right. It's being used not just for playing games, it's being used by Facebook to determine whether it, um, uh, send you a notification about something, um, or also like to imp uh, like to adjust on the fly the quality of streaming video, to network, um, to route packets across networks, financial um, trading like models, or just uh, lo lots of things. People are finding um, uses for it, and I guess my prediction for next year is that I think we'll see a lot more progress in reinforcement learning. But in terms of like cybersecurity, since this is what we are talking about. Um, this year at Black Hat USA, uh, one, one group showed this deep exploit, which is a uh, reinforcement learning model, which takes um, a number of different actors. They're all running in parallel, maybe on different machines. And it trains them um, to, to do like penetration testing. And then it learns which attacks work against which um, profiles. Um, and it's a, I think it's, it's still somewhat academic looking, but it's, it's pretty cool. And you, if you can imagine, um, there are many other similar applications in cybersecurity, mostly on the, on the like penetrating testing or fuzzing side that are interesting, like password guessing or like um, application fuzzing, things like that. So I would imagine that people might actually publish, even if it's just academic, but may, maybe publish something um, that uses reinforcement learning for, for these sort of things. What was interesting about 2018? Yeah, so Cambridge Analytica um, and the whole big controversy about how they, they took some data, most of which was publicly available, and did some nasty things with it. And some of those things would have been based on, on the sort of data analysis techniques that, that are used every day, right? That are used for like marketing analytics or, or targeted marketing campaigns or um, recommendation systems or um, predictive analysis, things like this, right? So they took that data and they worked it up in a way that they could then manipulate the public or, or try to manipulate the public. And, um, and I think that this is uh, the moment where may maybe more people started to understand what is possible with that data that's, that's mostly freely available. There's the legendary case from 2012 where Target, the store chain, sent advertising on items you need when a child is born. And that's how a teenager's parents found out that their girl was pregnant. As, and, you know, that caused huge outcry. And so, like you said, people have, they, they, they've learned about, you know, how advertising can be targeted and things like that. But it seems like, you know, people are really, really bad at understanding that, you know, if it can be done with one type of data, it can be done with other types of data. If it can be done for one purpose, it can probably be done for another purpose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when do people start to reinforce that? When do they actually start to learn that, you know, if it happens somewhere, there's a high likelihood it's going to happen again? Uh, agree, yeah, I agree. I don't think that any, any particularly advanced techniques were used for this, uh, for the target thing, right, for figuring out when someone's pregnant and then sending them the right kind of advertising. Uh, but that sort of stuff has been available for a long time, right? And it has been in use for a long time. But nobody really drew the dots between ne nefarious uses for that, or n more nefarious than we were already were seeing at that point, right? Not particularly like, you know, um, politically motivated or, or that sort of thing. And, and, and social engineering, right? So getting you to do something that might lead to, lead to something like being fished or, or scammed or, or something like that, right? Um, so I guess that my point is that like, uh, you know, when, when we get questions about like how is AI being used maliciously, I think that's a good thing to point at. You know, I think that's a good thing to point at to say, look at what they could do with that data think about what could be done, right? Think about what anyone could do if they wanted to do something malicious with that data that is mostly publicly available. That was a great conversation. Thank you for that recap of 2018 and all those predictions. I guess we'll just have to see what the future brings. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSound. Thanks for listening.